Hey, are you here? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, right here, right now, it's time for the Paul Leslie Hour. In this episode, we have a returning guest joining us, and it's a great honor that we welcome back America's songwriter, Jimmy Webb. Jimmy Webb is one of the all-time greats. Jimmy's a singer, a songwriter, composer, pianist, performing and recording artist. Webb's an inductee in the Songwriters Hall of Fame, the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame, and is a recipient of the Songwriters Hall of Fame Johnny Mercer Award. On top of that, he's one of Paul's absolute favorite writers and artists. In his book, Songwriters of Songwriting, Paul Zollo said this, A night with Jimmy at the Keys is not unlike getting to hear George Gershwin or Cole Porter live. It's hard to believe one guy could have written all these amazing songs. If you get a chance to see him live, grab it. People ask why nobody writes songs like they used to. Well, fortunately for us all, Jimmy Webb still does. That's Paul Zollo. Speaking of seeing Jimmy Webb live, you may be aware that he's got three concert dates in late October in North Carolina, the 26th, 28th, and 29th. Who's going? Hey, <laughs> then in early February, he's got two more dates in Florida. You can get more information and tickets at jimmyweb.com. That's W-E-B-B, jimmyweb.com. Just remember this, the Paul Leslie Hour is made possible by listeners and viewers just like you. Please visit thepaulleslie.com slash support and be a supporter of independent media. And we thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls, it's time. Paul, Jimmy Webb, let's get this show on the road. What do you guys say? Hello, Jimmy Webb. Hey, it's uh, it it is me. It is me. <laughs> Paul, how are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm hanging in there. You know, for uh, like my mid seventies, I feel pretty good. I'm still I'm still playing concerts and uh, writing songs, and you know, doing what I always did, really. Well, this is good. Well, I, thank you so much for coming on here. It's a great honor. No, no, it's my honor. Um, it's, uh, you know, I'm very privileged to, you know, maybe uh, maybe get the word out there to people that I'm still performing and that COVID, COVID didn't take me down. <laughs> no, it's a, it's, it's a great opportunity for me. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to be joined by America's songwriter. I could talk about a lot of songs that uh, have done very well. They are famous to the world. And I thought I would just, instead of going into a, an elaborate introduction like that, I'll just say the songs of Jimmy Webb have really resonated with people. They've found their way into a lot of people's hearts, mine included. And so with that, I say... Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. It's an honor. So... I would like to know from a guy like you, how important are songs? Well, I I believe, well, my personal belief is that songwriting is a very important job and that it's been underrated since almost the very beginning of the, the whole entertainment industry, since uh, vaudeville, if you will. I know that... As an example, I, I cite this. I'm, I'm on the board of directors at ASCAP. I've been there for 22 years now. And we've been fighting nonstop to help preserve the right of songwriters to be paid when their music is used for other people's business purposes. Now, you would think that would be a simple concept, but it's not. And, uh, this is typified by the fact that when before before talkies, when 
movies were silent movies and they needed a piano player to come in and sort of improvise a score to, you know, the Battle of Waterloo or, or some epic, they would, par they would, and th this was mostly, uh, you know, I would say um, a kind of on the spot composition or, or uh, you know, this sort of dredged up from various classical works, whatever, Paul, it doesn't matter. These guys were paid a dollar a day. They sat in these movie houses for hours in the dark playing, you know, their hearts out and, and, and they were making a dollar a day. It's never changed. It's never changed. We're still making a dollar a day. And I don't want to, you know, um, make that the, you know, <laughs> the cheerful start of the interview. <laughs> but the fact is that song, songwriting is not considered to be a, a serious, a serious pursuit any longer at any rate. And, and one of the reasons for that is that is it is no longer a, a serious pursuit. The songs that are being written today are pretty low quality, uh, right across the board. I don't personally feel that rap music. I don't believe that those are songs. I think those are that's a specialized form of you know a kind of um, it's it's a form of expression. It's closer to poetry than it is to songwriting. And, uh, you know, I know that I'm I'm sort of asking for a barrage of criticism when I say that. But to me, songwriters were Cole Porter, uh, Harry Warren, Le uh, uh, Lennon and McCartney, Hal David, Burt Bacharach, Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein three, And so all my aspirations, all, all my... All my conceptions are based on really traditional values, uh, melodies, chord structure, lyrics that make sense that aren't just sexual vents or anger vents, but uh, not just explosions of, of, of excess energy, but actually have a beginning, a middle, and an end, you know. I am I'm I'm firmly lodged in the past. I I can't get over the idea that the really quality songs are difficult to write. That uh, uh, songwriters should be justly compensated, and that means parity with artists. That means songwriters should make as much as the artists make. So you know, let let me take a pause in that diatribe and just let you you know, move on to, to another subject if you like. <laughs> well, I think we're, we're off to a good start. That's for sure. And, you know, there are people in spite of the fact that not all people revere songwriters. There are a lot of people that do me included. And, you know, I just want to tell you when people I've interacted face to face with through the years, when we get into conversations there have been times where I've told people that I interviewed you, like there there was a man down in Florida, Howard Curry, and his eyes got big when I said that I had interviewed you. And I'm just curious because there are a lot of people who revere you. What does it feel like to be revered? Well, uh, first of all, we'll just, uh, for the sake of of the interview, we'll we'll assume that that's that's accurate to some degree. <laughs> I, I I don't like to dwell on it. I I think revere is you know a hard thing to do. I it it embarrasses. It always makes the blood rush to my face. I I, I it, it's it's a difficult thing for me to deal with mm. uh, because. I've been writing songs since I was 12 years old. So it's kind of like body chemistry. It's like, it's sort of like, you know, being revered for, you know, going to the toilet. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's pretty crude, but it's, it's being revered for something that is so in a, in a sense, in a sense, commonplace uh, to me. And 
I think that I would rather be revered for more important things. The relationship I have with my children would be a good one. I guess from a from a from a songwriting point of view, I think it's it's better to be revered than it is to be ignored. Hmm. And you know, it's 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 small comfort at times to be revered when other people are getting rich for doing absolutely nothing in the same industry. So, uh, you know, I, if I, I, I'd have to say I have mixed, mixed emotions about that status. I remember one time I walked on a, on an elevator and heard, literally I heard the Montavani orchestra because uh, believe it or not, they had an unmistakable sound and they were playing by the time I get to Phoenix, I think. And, and I, I thought, uh, well, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I've become, I've become a legend. If you hear you, if you hear your music on an elevator, you're a legend. And that's not necessarily, I mean, I remember one time I walked, walked into a path mark or Safeway or something like that. And they were playing uh, Joni, Joni Mitchell. And they were playing A Case of You. And it was Joni Mitchell. It wasn't a, It wasn't an instrumental. It was her record. And here it is playing, you know, here's this, I mean, absolutely fantastic, you know, song. And people are buying the aftershave lotion, <laughs> packing their, <laughs> getting their toothpaste, and standing in line, and the kids are, you know, crying and, and I realized in that moment that Joni Mitchell had become a legend. That's that's how you know. Interesting. Well, I would say that another way that somebody could be a legend, you know, other than that, what would come close to me is when Frank Sinatra records or performs something that you wrote. Now, I remember the last time you were on, you were talking about how you and your brother were named for the Dorsey brothers. Yeah. Was that just, well, yeah. that's true. Oh, oh yeah. Well, yes, because in the forties uh, and in the fifties to some degree, I suppose, but certainly in the forties, there was, there was a, a, a kind of cultural phenomenon associated with naming children after celebrities. So, for instance, in the 40s, you had a lot of kids named Mickey for two reasons, Mickey Mouse and Mickey Rooney. Hmm. So the, I came very, very close to being named Mickey. But my, my father was a, a fan of the big bands. He, um, you know, he, he named me Jimmy. And then the the way the story goes is that he decided that it would, he want, he wanted you know us to be like the Dorsey brothers. So my my brother Tom he got he got stuck with Tommy, and it's it's our it's our name. I mean, in a way, this is this is more provenance for the story, if you will. It's my name, Jimmy. It's on it's on my birth. It's not James. It's Jimmy J I M M Y, and and his is Tommy. So I have a son named James, you know, I, I didn't want to saddle any of my, I have five boys. I didn't want to saddle any of them with Jimmy <laughs> because it's a diminutive and you go through your life. Sort of way. I remember in Hollywood when I was 16, 17 years old, that I, that people started calling me Jim Webb because they thought it sounded hipper and it, it showed up in a couple of press releases, and then it's it sort of got to be something I kind of got used to. Somebody put out an album called Jim Webb Sings Jim Webb. Terrible record. It was a bunch of uh, bunch of demos that they had overdubbed an orchestra on, and I think it did me irreparable harm. But um, I sort of went sour on Jim Webb. You know. I think that Jimmy Webb has a better rhythm to it. I think it's just my, it's the lyricist in me, but clearly it's a nickname, Jimmy. It's not a proper name. 
like uh, Paul Williams, who's our, our chairman of the board at ASCAP. That's a real name. I mean, we call him Polly sometimes, but I think it's nice to have a real name. Uh, and and I think that it was uh, regrettable sometimes that that children ended up being named Shirley because of uh, uh, Shirley Temple, but that's what happened. And you can you can ask around; it happened. Hmm. Was having Frank Sinatra record something you write was that in particular a knockout for you? Well, <clears throat> yes. That was the kind of epiphany for me because I wasn't taking all of it too seriously at that point. I I was thinking in terms of the top 40. I just I'd worked at Motown for a while. I got a cut there with the Supremes on their Christmas album. I had a Dick Glasser over at Warner Brothers had cut a couple of my things with the Everly Brothers, which, you know, was, I was impressed, you know. <laughs> I met Van Dyke Parks on one of those sessions, and uh, he was playing piano. And I was kind of taking it in stride, I think, you know, like, okay, well, I'm kind of getting somewhere this is, one of these days, I just want to get a record with Glenn Campbell. I, I, I'd always wanted to, to have a Glenn Campbell record since I was 14. So that was a big thrill for me. But I was, I was driving down the Santa Ana freeway one day, and a version of Didn't We by Mr. Snatcher came on the radio with this lovely arrangement. And I think, I think there was almost a very severe, massive, epic pileup on the Santa, Santa Ana freeway while I was kind of guiding my car over to the, <laughs> to the shoulder through about eight <laughs> lanes of traffic. <laughs> and I got myself stopped and I, and, and I, something had happened. Something had happened that was kind of electric, and I, I sat there saying to myself, "Yes, but what is it?" You know, and and then I realized that to have that man record one of your songs and actually put it on a record was becoming part of history, not just musical history. It was actually, your name is now in the history book, Jimmy, you know? And that, that hit me solidly. The, the importance of being recognized by someone like that, who, knew, who really knew songs and respected writers. Jimmy Van Heusen and Sammy Kahn and all these great, guys who used to just hang out with you know it made me kind of feel like i was in that crowd maybe maybe on the fringe somewhere but maybe i was a little bit part of the great american songbook and i remember thinking how could that happen to me in my lifetime how could that happen to a kid from oklahoma who you know did most of my growing up in the panhandle out there on the flat you know i mean prairie with nothing but telephone wires out on the highway um a preacher's kid you know had a dream that i was going to be a songwriter which you know my father thought was absolutely crazy he thought i'd lost my mind and i had lost my mind because i i I, when I was 17 years old, I was on the streets of uh, Los Angeles walking around with, you know, a paper sack full of uh, lyrics and, and melodies. But that's when it became real for me, I guess. I, uh, when I heard that record, it was like, okay, I guess I'm a songwriter. So I guess I better start writing some songs. <laughs> 
and have you ever. <laughs> it, <laughs> I, I think it's it's safe to say that your songs are a part of the Great American Songbook. You've got these tour dates coming up in North Carolina. We've uh-huh. got October 26th in Elon, the 28th in High Point, North Carolina, and the 29th in Lenore, North Carolina. Yeah. When you take the stage like these dates coming up, what is it you hope the person out there in the crowd, the person sitting in the audience, gets from the experience of seeing you live? Well, I think that one of the uh, mishaps of the sort of byproducts of, of, of rock and roll, which I love rock and roll, all I you know ever really wanted to do besides write songs was was be in a rock and roll band, have that camaraderie. And the Rolling Stones are my favorite rock and roll band, and Charlie Watts was my favorite drummer. You know, but so I I I want you know I'd like those those of you who are listening who who think you know that I, you know, I don't know that that I that I that I'm snobby about about traditional music. I I want you to know that I love rock and roll. But one of the byproducts of rock and roll was an inattention to lyrics. And it was it was caused to to a great degree by by improper mixing. The drums were always loud, the bass was always loud, the guitar was always loud. There was a kind of an attitude it, it was. It wasn't a policy. We didn't sit down and agree on this, but there was a, there was a uh, a philosophy in the in the in the control room that you that you buried the vocals in the track as much as you could. You let the track carry the day, and you let the the artists sort of ride along on this. This fantastic vehicle with these, with this wonderful bass line and this great snare sound, and there was so much attention paid. Up. I mean, if I had all the hours back that I've that I've sat in the studio listening to some guy whack on a snare drum, you know, I'd have a, I'd have a maybe a couple of more years to live, because you know we used to whack snare drums for hours trying to get them to sound right. And then we'd mix the record, and I, for one, because I just put my hand up timidly in back of the class, uh, gee, I can't understand the lyrics. Hmm. <laughs> you know, it's a great story about, and in fact, there was a book that came out about misunderstood lyrics. Yeah. You, you, are you familiar? Yes. <laughs> one, of, one, of them, one of them was the... One of them was the Paul, was the Paul Simon song "The Boxer," and someone in the book had written in to say, I, "I don't understand why Paul Simon would be writing about a horse in the middle of this song about this boxer." And so the interviewer said, "I don't understand. What do you mean?" And she said, "Well, it's just a come on from the horse on Seventh Avenue." <laughs> Just to come on from the horse <laughs> on Seventh Avenue. That is what happened. That is what happened to lyrics. So you, even you had, and here, here is, I mean, Paul Simon play, paid attention to what to what went on in the, in the mixing, as did Artie, and uh, as as did the Beatles, and for the most part, the Beatles did a I'd say better than average job of putting their vocals out there where you could understand. And I think that their success had something to do with that as well, because the songs were so interesting and the language was scintillating and it was seductive. Why would you want that Barrett? Why, why would you want, why would you not want to hear Penny Lane? I mean, you have to hear Penny Lane because the lyric puts you there cinematically it places you in that you know you're surrounded with penny lane but you're not if you don't understand the lyrics so to answer the question 
when I'm in performance, to me, lyric is king. I'm not the greatest singer in the world, but I try to sing in tune. I really put a lot of energy into being on pitch. But the most energy I put in is elucidating the lyric, making sure that if you, if you, you know, if you were confused about the lyric to MacArthur Park when you came in here, maybe you won't be so confused after you leave. And it's easy for me to do because I'm accompanying myself and I can put the lyrics out there right where I want them. I don't have to worry about the band sneaking up behind me and, and, and turning the amps up too loud or the PA going off or something like that. So, number one, I think that's that's what I'm carrying. The, well, you know, Jerome Kern called the burthen which is a maritime term that means it's the cargo in the ship and which they called over at Motown. We're very serious about this. The message. The message and the burthen are the same thing. It's this indefinable code at the heart of the song that you want, that you absolutely must communicate to the listener or they miss the whole point they miss the whole point so as much as i love rock and roll there's a lot of rock and roll that i think you know probably probably the voices were mixed down because the voices weren't very good or the voices were mixed down because the lyrics weren't very good but in, in, in some cases, you simply don't know what the artist is. I mean, Louis, Louis, uh, Louis, 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 oh, baby. <laughs> me got, I think he says me got to go now. But I, could, I really couldn't be sure. Right. And there's songs like, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to go into, you know, individual, I'm, I'm gonna sacrifice any lambs here. But I think that it's something that once you're aware of it and you're listening to fit, to particularly 50s, 60s, and 70s music, you will, you will have to admit that there are passages in those records that you don't know the lyrics to. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and there's a, reason, there's a reason you don't know the lyrics. <laughs> right. Right. Nobody knows in some cases. <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, it took me a long time to 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 to, fi uh, to figure out knights in white satin, because I thought they were saying knights in white satin. But then I thought, but that's kind of like, why are they singing about knights? You know, knights dressed in white satin, you know, because it was something about the phrasing that. I can't explain it, but I was convinced that K N it was K N I G H T S knights knights in white satin, and then of course it was years later that I went, oh you fool, it's knights like N I G H knights in white satin. It's about love. It's about sex. So it's very easy for for the you know for the ideas in a song to go astray. If you don't have someone like Mr. Sinatra singing the song who cared, who, who, uh, I don't know how, how, how I can put this. He caressed the lyrics. Nobody sung lyrics like Mr. Sinatra. I think they were almost more important to him than the notes. And Rosemary Clooney and uh, Ella Fitzgerald. She is, is, is incredibly gifted when it comes to delivering, delivering the, the whole message of the song. And the lyrics should, the lyrics should influence the performance. They shouldn't just be there as kind of the wallpaper. I think that a lot of, a lot of the singing that, uh, you know, that I hear these days, it's filled with melisma, which is, you know, a fancy way of saying too many notes. But it's like the lyrics have, 
we, you know, are clearly in some of these records, and again, I'm not going to get personal, but in some of these records, the lyrics have taken second place to the singer's desire to show you how incredible their vocal virtuosity is. They can sing a whole bunch of 30-second notes in a row on one syllable and without ever without ever saying the word, without ever singing the word. It's all about listen to my voice, listen to how great my voice is. The lyrics have clearly, over time and increment by increment, they've been pushed back. And and sometimes I think, well, maybe that's a good thing because it, maybe it just makes us appreciate uh, my funny Valentine more. You know, maybe maybe it makes us have to sit down and really come to grips with Larry Hart and say, "Wow, who was this guy? How intense can you know can." Lyric poetry, possibly, can anything be more intense than Larry Hart? Maybe it forces us back to those people to listen to them because we don't get that kind of sustenance in today's music at all. I have to agree with you there for, for certain. There's something pretty timely uh, I wanted to go into just a little bit. Bob Dylan has a book that's coming out on November 1st, The Philosophy of Modern Song. And one of the chapters, there's about 60 chapters, everything from blues, but lots of great American songbook type songs, a couple country songs. I'm curious, when you heard that Mr. Dylan was writing about you, how did that hit you? Well, I have a little bit, and, and, I, and I say little, it's more minuscule. I have a, a minuscule background with Bob personally. I, in, a, in 1985, uh, after I first moved back to New York, I was, I was hanging out a lot with Jan Winter. And one night he said, would you like to go hear a Bob Dylan album? And I said, sure. And lo and behold, we walked into a recording studio and there was Bob. And uh, the name of the record was Empire Burlesque. And it was a very, very good record. Very high, I thought, high standards in the production. And particularly, uh, strange, strange that we're talking about it, in the area, in the area of, of uh, elucidation and, and proper... Uh, a, a proper projection of the meaning of the lyrics because I think Bob's lyrics are confusing enough at times. And I say that in a, not in a pejorative way, but they are complex enough that they really demand an accurate reading. And so I was listening that night to the way Bob kind of spits those words out and he gets them. He nails them, and he makes and he mixes his vocals up so that you can you can hear them, and that's amazing because almost everybody can sing a Bob Dylan song. Think about that. But that's that's because he cares about the words. And he and I talked a bit. My uh, my one of my best friends, uh, Freddie Tackett, who ended up as a lifelong member of Little Feet. Uh, Freddie was playing guitar for Bob on the all along the Watchtower tour. And Freddie kept saying, you got to come down to Madison Square Garden and see Bob. And I said, ah, you know, I don't want to do that. I said, all, all due respect. I said, you know, I, it's, it's all, all too loud for me. He said, no, you got to come, man. He says, I can't really tell you why, but you got to come. Hmm. So, I said, well, okay. <laughs> Just got my earplugs out, <laughs> went out to Madison Square Garden. Really enjoyed the show a lot. About halfway through the show, Bob said, Jimmy, this one's for you. 
Wow. It was like completely, I mean, personal and yet strange because it was in Madison Square Garden and Clyde King, who was one of the background singers, also a very, very close friend of mine from my session days in L.A., she stepped up to the mic and they did a duet of one of my songs called Let's Begin. And I subsequently found out that he had been doing that song every night on the All Along the Watchtower tour. He did it in Germany. He did it in France. He did it all over the world. Bob Dylan's out there singing one of my songs. Holy shit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, uh, who would have thought it? We, we, we spoke from time to time. One time we had a conversation about strings. And I thought, oh, God, I love this conversation because I would love to do the strings on a Bob Dylan album. Just strings. Just strings and Bob Dylan. But, I, you know, I've always been kind of shy. I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I, I can't explain it, but I didn't, perhaps I didn't engage enough. Yeah, sometimes I, that's. You know, that's that's just one of my failings. I remember another another time we were talking about where I lived up in Tuxedo Park, and he said, I understand you have a body of water <laughs> on your property. And it really wasn't on my property, but I lived a stone's throw from a lake that was about two miles by a mile long. And I, I for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how he knew that. But uh, I reassured him that, yes, I did live live near a fairly large body of water. And the thing is that he's inscrutable. So, you know, you, you don't know. I mean, I got a request not long ago. I think it was about two years ago from his publishers in England saying, you know, we're putting out. We're putting out a book of Bob's songs, and it it's all of his songs. We've got all of his I mean, it, it was like a hundred, hundred or hundreds. I don't know. How. It was all of his songs. And he, he would like you to write the forward. And, you know, I was just kind of like freaking stunned, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said, what? <laughs> Clarify, repeat and clarify. Well, he wants you to, you know, he wants a little, you know, like 150, 200 words maybe, you know, but write what you feel. He just wants you to, you know, just write the forward. I said, absolutely, you have it. You have it. Tell him I consider it a great honor. And I went ahead and did that. So, you know, it's it's been kind of an off and on we are aware of each other. We have been in contact with each other at times, you know, for years and years, very much aware of him, very much aware of him. And to me, he's like, he's, he's the first singer songwriter, you know, uh, some people say, well, singer songwriters came in in the seventies, you know, I beg your pardon, <laughs> you know, but they came in a long time ago. And, He's the first one that I remember in the modern era. So, you know, I look look up to him a lot. The, you know, the the little the little bows that he's made in my direction. I mean, I I've, I've appreciated, you know, immeasurably. I mean, it's it's wonderful to to know. I mean, it's it's one of the things that makes writing songs worth writing songs is to get a nod from someone that you really, really admire. It reminds me of when uh, James Taylor recorded Wichita Lineman. I was bowled over by that. And and it, not just because it was, it was, it was done on an album called Covers. So they were all out. It was all outside material, but it wasn't just that he recorded it. It was a really fine recording. It was a very, very studied interpretation. It was obvious that a lot of time had gone into it. It was an extraordinary version. 
of, of all the versions I could think of, I put I would put it in a category definitely with Glenn's version, which is pretty hard to touch. Yeah. But James really did a fantastic job. So, you know, those little things, they, they make, you know, uh, sometimes a job that feels a little bit fringy, you know, and a little bit, you know, maybe, you know, you know, sometimes you really do feel like you're in the back room and, and, and it's not that I have any overpowering lust for fame or, or to be Bruce Springsteen and, 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 and really have that kind of life. I don't, you know, I prefer the audiences that I play for because every person that comes into that room, I feel like we're going to have a relationship at some point during that show. I'm going to reach that person. So it may be three or 400 people, but I'm close enough to them to feel them. I can feel their, I can smell them. I can, I can almost touch them. And I love the intimacy of that. I always have, you know, I'm, I've played, I date in, I date my cabaret performing in New York from the eighties. I, I played, um, Jan Walman's uptown. I played the Algonquin. I played the ballroom. I played the rainbow room. I played the bottom line. I played Michael Feinstein's at the Regency quite a few times. And I've never been disappointed in a, in a, in a, a nightclub audience. I've never, I've always come away from it enriched somehow because of the proximity of the people and the enthusiasm and energy that comes off of them like like some like a force field a just bo- buoyant feeling of walking out of the club and going wow that was that was great whatever that was you know I'm not sure what it was but let's do some more of that you know there's something about there's an intimacy about it that you, you, you once you get up really once you get up around a thousand or twelve hundred people you can't duplicate that because it's a mass of people most of the time you can't see them anyway because of the lights but it's it's two completely different kinds kinds of performing and people who do who do small audiences, they love doing small audiences. They don't do it necessarily because they're stuck with that. I, you know, Judy Collins, she and I have done doubles before. She's Maureen McGovern. I've done a lot of playing with her. I've, I played with Paul Williams. I played with Billy Davis and Marilyn McCoo from the fifth dimension. Glenn and I, Glenn and I did cabaret together. It's, um, I like to bring songs that people know and a couple of songs that maybe they don't know and a lot of laughter. You know, I, a show that isn't full of, of, of laughter and joy is not, is not worth doing. Hmm. And I love to, sometimes I do others like I do. You've lost that love and feeling sometimes with the audience. We have the best time. You know, I sing Bill Medley's part, and they sing Bobby Hatfield's part. And then we all sing three-part on You've Lost That Love and Feeling. But in a way, I'm saying I take a break from my material sometimes. It's not just a, a moratorium on, you know, the you know the mostly sad repertoire of Jimmy Webb. There's, we do a lot, I do a lot of different things in the show and, uh, it's my way of kind of arm twisting here and saying, come on out and see the show before you make up your mind about who I am or what I do. I also want to say to all of our listeners in Florida, we have a, a good listenership in Florida. There's two dates coming up there too, 
February 3rd in Largo, Florida, and then February 5th in West Palm. And you can get tickets at jimmyweb.com. So I love West Palm. That's a great audience. I'm looking forward to seeing that group. I'm I'm wondering if I can read this question that was sent in by one of the listeners. Yes, sir. Okay. So this this is from Brendan Mayer. His father is in Jimmy Buffett's Coral Reefer Band, but they perform Brendan and his father perform as a duo and they have taken to performing a lot of your songs. So he asked Brendan, the young, the son of Peter, he says, a song like Wichita Lineman feels timeless, but did he feel either constrained or inspired by other popular music of the time at a time like today, when so much of commercially viable music doesn't exactly feel timeless? How does that affect the craft? Great question from Brendan. Well, I, I traditionally, I, I have to be brash and say that I've never really gone along with the current. Most of my success has been swimming upstream. So whatever everybody else is doing, I try not to do that. I try to do something else. And sometimes that works for you. And sometimes it's disastrous. But for me, it's always been more enjoyable than just kind of doing what everybody else is doing. For instance, I, I sort of, pre I, I, I pretended that there wasn't any such thing as disco music. I just floated over that one. And the, the one exception is the one number one record I have, which Donna Summer cut. And it was such a fabulous, excuse me, such a fabulous vocal performance that I wasn't really paying attention. I, I thought, well, this is pretty good. I like it. It's got a beat. You know, you can dance to it. I wouldn't, you know, rush right out and write write a bunch of disco songs. You know, I mean, I've just had a number one record. I could have thought that way. Well, let's write another disco song. I just don't think that way. And I don't, for that reason, I don't really write a lot of songs for other people. And when I do, more often than not, it's a disaster. It, it, it gets sent back to me. I've been, Wichita Lyman, I wrote for Glenn. That is a, you know, written in stone. I wrote that for Glenn, no question. But most of the time, I'm, I'm sort of like a boutique, you know, and I've got these, this array of uh, maybe more like a flea market. And I put my stuff out on the table and I say, you know, rummage through here. And if you hear something, you know, if you, feels good to you please take it record it and i've been more fortunate that way than i have crafting it i i i really have some in built-in restraints to copying other things certainly i've been influenced by a lot of things i mean it's hardly necessary to say that I was influenced by Burt Backrack and Hal David and Lennon and McCartney. That's that's written all over my songs. I was written. I was also influenced by Hank Williams. However, some of the country writers, Don Schlitz, was, is, has been a favorite writer of mine. I mean, I think the the Gambler is nearly a perfect song. Bob Dylan is the trailblazer. I mean, he's the guy who, who really broke the mold and said, you know, uh, song, all these songs don't have to be about moon, June and, and spoon. I admire those, those kind of individualists, the characters that strike out in a different, <laughs> in a different direction. And sometimes, you know, unfortunately we really do strike out, but, when it pays off, it pays off big, and it's it's a uh, tremendous feeling of buoyancy and 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 like it's like dreaming that you're flying, 
when when a song like Highwayman is picked up, you know, by Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson, Johnny Cash, all four of them, all at the same time. And then years later, Amanda McBride and her crew come along, and, and the High Women, and they cut. I they 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 wrote their own lyric, but they but basically cut the same song. And you, well, I have a feeling that 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 wouldn't happen if the song didn't have some quality that makes it stand out from other songs of the same ilk and the same period you know it's 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 sort of provocative in a way it's like saying okay now i'm going to write a song about reincarnation you know so hold on but it's going to like have you know sailors and you know construction guys and it's going to have a lot of different souls and 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 the and the last guy's going to be they say I tell you this is a funny story I'd pass along to the caller that when they were playing highwaymen for those four superstars of outlaw country down in Nashville and nobody really knew, knew what was going to happen because that album project was not going well at the time and the two people who didn't know each other, believe it or not, is Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash did not know each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost impossible in Nashville, you know? Right. But it was a fact. So, And their voices were like so different that, that they weren't really blending too well on the record. And I think... Christopherson and, and Waylon were kind of lost in between the two. There was just, there just wasn't a, it hadn't come together. So they, depending on who you talk to, a different person, <laughs> even though Carl Jackson and Marty Stewart definitely had something to do with it, that's that's for sure. My song arrived, and Glenn had something to do with it. My song arrived in the studio and they, somebody had had the bright idea that since there were four of them and there were four verses that this might work out as a, a four man thing, pretty good idea. And so they're sitting there and they're playing it. They're playing, I think Glenn's version. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure it was Glenn's version. Glenn, Glenn was always the first to cut everything. So they're sitting there and they're all what, looking at each other, wondering, I wonder what Willie's going to say. I wonder what Johnny's going to say. He goes through the whole thing. Well, unbeknownst to the most of those guys, Willie has been into reincarnation since he was about 10 years old. <laughs> he always, he's always believed in reincarnation. <laughs> so that's, that's one ace that I had in my hand. And... It got over to the, the very end. Glenn sings the last verse, and they're all sitting there looking at each other and going, I wonder what Cash is going to do. <laughs> you know? And Johnny says, well, I want to fly the starship. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's funny. <laughs> that's, that, <laughs> that's the way those things happen. You know, you can't stop them. You can't stop them with a nuclear weapon. <laughs> well, you know, I uh, I could talk, to, I could ask you questions all all night, but I want to be respectful of your time. <laughs> You've been very generous with your time, but I, I'm wondering if I can just ask you a couple more. Okay. Yeah, sure. A couple more questions. Fine. All right. This is something that I was wondering about. You know, you mentioned the James Taylor cover. There have been some really, really interesting interpretations of yours, of your songs. Like Art Garfunkel, he's been, he's done a really great job with, with so many of your songs on record and in performance. Has there been a cover of one of your songs that surprised you? Like, it, it really... In a good way, you know, it was a surprising or you were surprised that that person 
interpreted it. Yeah, I've had a couple of, you know, kind of um, revelatory moments, I guess you would say. When Isaac Hayes recorded By the Time I Get to Phoenix, his version was 21 minutes long. And the first 15 to 17 minutes of it is all him talking about this woman it's almost like a precursor to, to to a rap song it except it's to me it's a it's a lot more interesting but it, it really has a kind of a storyline to it and he's he's sort of filling in the background of what might or might not be going on with by the time we get to phoenix and then close close to the end of it he he actually he, he does sing the song you know he he, he the band is playing all the time and he's just talking, you know, and it's like, it's almost like a, like a rap that he would get in. Probably he, he would, he's done, probably done it on the radio a million times. Right. Cause he was a radio guy and that's kind of what it feels like. But uh, then the reading of the song is very soulful. It's very, uh, takes me back to my Motown days, really. It was uh, a kind of a cultural, a different cultural view of the song in total. I think that you could say there was a good deal of surprise associated with that. That and the fact that it was the whole side of the, the whole of one side of his album, Hot Buttered Soul, 1969. By the time I get to Phoenix, was one side of a record <laughs> of, of an, a, a long playing album that you know kind of surprising. I remember that that when uh, they were doing the the Apollo ten space mission, uh, I was interested in it because uh, one of the commander of that mission, Tom Tom Stafford, was a fellow Oklahoman. And uh, I thought, this is far out, and Okie's like, you know, flying around the moon. <laughs> and one of the things that they used to wake the guys up in the morning was the music of the day. And so one morning when the spacecraft, this is, this is Apollo 10 now, when the spacecraft was about halfway to the moon, they were flying a figure eight around the moon. When it reached about the middle of that figure eight on the way out, they woke they woke the, the astronauts up with up up and away. So, up up and away was actually being played in outer space for the astronauts. Wild. Well, <laughs> I was a kid. I always wanted to be an astronaut, and. I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy and fly jets and, and, and shoot people. I, and I'm glad I, I got over that, but I never got over that feel, that love of science fiction. And, you know, I was just a, an addict at 10 years, 10 years old. I was reading Ray Bradbury and Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov, and Robert Heinlein. I was pretty much taking all my, my education out of the science fiction books. But, you know, I, I woke up that morning and I didn't, I had no idea that how would I know that they're going to play my song in outer space? You know what I mean, Paul? Yeah. So it was, <laughs> it was pretty crazy. And I still think about it and it's, it's there on the, the uh, NASA still has the, the tapes of the music that was played. So it's still on a tape there somewhere, the conversation between the astronauts and Houston and then up, up and away. And then, you know, these guys, I guess, you know, I don't know how well they slept. How, how could know, you? I don't know how well you could sleep on your way to the moon like that, but uh, apparently they needed a wake up call. So that was uh i uh, tell you the truth, that's kind of a high point for me. I, I dig that a lot. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I'm curious to know about how you got the idea to do slipcover. I always like it when singers and recording artists, when they, they do the unexpected, 
And slipcover, it's such an interesting idea. I really, I really like the interpretation you did of God only knows, for example. But uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, slipcover is an instrumental. Uh, it's uh, I would co- it comes sort of under the broad heading of piano arrangements, you know, which I do off the top of my head. That that came out of my work in church with improvising offertories, special material for funerals, for all the different things that we used to deal with in church. My father being a Baptist minister and all. So I I guess my first real role as a musician was as an accompanist. And I think I'm still a pretty good accompanist. I, and I've done it quite a lot. You mentioned Artie. I've done it quite a lot with Artie Garfunkel. We have done a lot of live work on stage, just the two of us. And just that duality of the of the singer and and the underpinnings of the chord structure and what you leave out is often more important than what you put in. But uh, it was sort of out of that tradition. And we were in, co- we were in the middle of COVID and I, I, I didn't want to be completely idle. And I decided I've always wanted to do this. There's some certain tunes that I'm in love with, just like, you know, people are, People are, 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 you know, enchanted by maybe, you know, something that I've done. Well, I have a list of songs that I adore. And so I thought, well, this would be fun. This would just be pure, unadulterated fun to just play the piano and not have to worry about singing. And I could probably even charge more money for it if I left my voice off. So... Kind of tongue in cheek, I went down to the studio and I started doing some of my favorite songs. I went down to a little place here in Glen Cove, Tiki. It's like a survivor, a surviving recording studio with a very, very nice seven foot Yamaha. And I went in and I just played. And uh, the songs are really from my, you know, they're my. There's, there's, I have to, cl- I have to clear this immediately. There is a, a song of mine. The Moon is the Harsh Mistress is on that album, but I was forced, literally forced, to put that song on the album. I would much rather have done something by another composer. But I wanted to do Paul Simon, so I did Old Friends, which I think is kind of a benchmark for for the baby boomers, you know how terribly strange to be 70. You know, it was like uh, kind of a message. And also in a broader sense, it was like, we are old friends, all of us. This music has made us old friends. You know, this is something that we've all shared. The Long and Winding Road by Paul McCartney, God Only Knows by Brian Wilson, Accidentally Like a Martyr by Warren Zevon, Good Night, My Darling by Billy Joel, all in Love is Fair by Stevie Wonder, Randy Newman's Marie, which, uh, you know, I, I, can't, I can't even listen to without crying after all these years. It means a lot to me, and all these people mean a lot to me personally. You know, the one guy that I, that I, that I wish I had done on the first album was Bob Dylan, but that didn't work out. You know, I, I was I was just kind of doing them haphazardly and all of a sudden we had enough we had we had enough songs and so I'm definitely gonna do another one. As it says on the jacket, you know, it's a style of piano playing that was really mentored in the studio by the wrecking crew by Larry Nectel, who I used to sit beside, you know, for hours and hours, day after day in the studios of Hollywood and just soaking up everything I could get from him. There's also a component of a little classical training, not nearly as much as someone like, for instance, Billy has, but I, I've had a little classical training and, uh, and I'm an aficionado. aficionado. I, I, I listen to very little except classical music. 
And then the third component, I guess, would be the the gospel, the gospel element, the kind of lilting uh, Floyd Kramer. You know, Floyd Kramer had a hit record with "By the Time I Get to Phoenix" in 1969. I think it went to 34 on the top 40 chart, which is not shabby. So Floyd Kramer with that little what they call in Nashville slip key. So from slip key, I got slip cover and, you know, made the album, put it out, really pretty much put it out, put it out on curve, but it might as well be a, 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 you know, it might as well be my own label because mostly what I've sold are CDs. And I sell them at my concerts, and people like it. You know, they. Uh, I did the cover. I did a self-portrait, put that on the cover, and so it was immensely rewarding experience to 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 actually do something when the rest of the world was paralyzed by COVID, and certainly I was sequestered with my wife and her mother. We were a pod, the three of us. We did not have any contact with the outside world for three years, well, for two and two years. And then year before last, I went to, I went to England and did a, no, it's not year before, it was last year. I went to England and did a 10 city tour and stopped over in Dublin. And somehow I got COVID in Dublin. And I had I had COVID before I got I got off the plane with COVID, hmm. and it rocked me a little bit, you know. But uh, I I've had all my shots and all that stuff, so you know I I I, I can't I can't afford to let any more time pass without performing, without making another. I have songs. I'm ready to make another solo record. I'm just sort of waiting for something, and I don't know what it is, but something will. When they pull the trigger somewhere, we're we're going to. I'm going to do another solo album if it's the last one I ever make. I'm going to do it. So, that's well, my story, Paul. <laughs> we're looking forward to it. A- another Jimmy Webb album and a, a follow up to Slipcover, and. Jimmy Webb, thank you so much for this interview. It's It's been great to reconnect with you. Yes. And you, Paul, you are a, a delightful guy to, to just, for just letting me ramble on like this. Well, I've enjoyed it very much. I remember the, the first time we talked, I, I was Mr. Webbing you throughout the interview, and you said, <laughs> call me Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> It's the only name I've got, Paul. <laughs> That's right. I That's wish right. it was I wish it was James, but what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> well, Jimmy Webb, until next time, sir. Okay. All right, Paul. And there will be a next time if I have anything to do with it. Oh, that's great to hear. Okay. All right. All right, Paul. See you down the road. Get easy. All right. You too. Bye. Thank you for stopping by today. If you enjoyed our program, consider telling a friend about it. The Paul Leslie Hour is made possible through people just like you. So you want to keep the show going, right? Go to thepaulleslie.com. That's thepaulleslie.com. Click on Support the Show. And thanks to everyone who contributes. Performance of the intro music is courtesy of John Primerano, The Entertainer, written by Scott Joplin. End credit theme music is courtesy of John Primerano, the traditional song, Corina, Corina. Your announcer is Dan Gold. Hey, that's me. The show is hosted and produced by Paul Leslie, and we'll see you next time on the Paul Leslie Hour.